Hi, so uh, I thought that since it's 6 p.m. and you've all attended other speeches, you might be a bit tired. So before I put you into slumber with the technical speech, uh, I'd like to show you a video, trailer video of the game that we are doing at Highwire Games. He was trying to lure us into the house. He kept saying, come here, mister, come here. Like that. Every time we would go into one of those buildings, you never know what to expect. Every day, guys knew the first guy through the door is probably going to die. Next, it's only natural for me to be next. Like, I hope it's quick, hope it's painless. You start to like plan your own death. Alright, and on this bombshell, I would like to welcome you to Peer-to-Peer -peer plus Host Migration versus Low-Cost Dedicated Servers in 2024. And we will find out what are those low-cost dedicated servers at the end of the presentation. Uh, so uh, let me start with a presentation outline because uh, uh, when someone is going to watch this video from the internet, I wanted to make uh, it super easy for that person to find specific information uh, in this presentation. So, uh, introduction obvious, we're going to go for peer-to-peer -peer basics for the people that never did peer-to-peer -peer and don't know what is the industry standard. Uh, after that, we're going to talk about different implementations of peer-to-peer -peer like EOS, WebRTC, etc. And after that, we're going to talk a little bit about host migration and a case study of uh, implementation of host migration in the very late stage of the project and what are the consequences of that. Um, then we're going to talk about alternatives to peer-to-peer -to -peer, and at the end we're going to talk about container instances. Um, okay, about me. So, uh, six and a half years uh, experience in game development, ten years experience in software development. I started in virtual reality for industry, uh, then I went to MPG, and after MPG I kind of found my harbor in uh, high-wire games. And we're making this wonderful game you just saw. <laughs> Okay, so the main motivation for this uh, speech is that um, I've done infrastructure a few times uh, in, my, in my life. And, uh, and uh, I remember when the first time I, I had to host servers at some place, right? I didn't know what, where, and how. And, and when you go to, to the large big tech providers, they, they don't know anything as well, for an example, how to make the regions, etc. Like, they're all like, yeah, we're, we're going to find out. So, uh, so I wanted to make a good source of information about this. Um, I wanted to debunk peer-to-peer -peer as cost-effective and, of course, share my experiences so you don't have to make the mistakes I did. Okay, so basic peer-to-peer. -peer. So we all know the Unreal Listen, ser listen Server, right? So. You might imagine that it's easy to make a peer-to-peer -peer game because you've got some other guy's IP, right? And you just connect to it. But uh, in the real-life situation, it's not, right? Because there is no such thing as your own private IP, right? I mean, you share the, the uh, output node of your internet service provider. So all of the people in, the, in your apartment block have more or less the same public IP if they use the same public provider. 
So how do we address those guys? How come when I send a packet to Google, uh, how come Google can respond to me? So basically when you make an unbound packet, your internal service provider assigns you a temporary port. So that's how, uh, how the, the, the server knows how to reply to you. So you might think that, so we can assign, uh, we can get a temporary uh, port assigned and maybe we could share that port with another person because then we've got so-called private IP, right? And uh, this solution is called a stun server. So we've got another server and uh, Mr. Chicken here, he sends, a, in this case, it's a game, right? So he sends a UDP request uh, to the stun server. Stun server knows in the, in the packet header, he knows who sent the IP and from which port it came. So the stun server can share this information with Mr. Dolphin here. And now Mr. Dolphin has the private IP of Mr. Chicken, right? And he can connect. So that's one way of doing it. But um, there is a problem. I don't know if you've done ever web development. There's a thing called uh, cross-origin policy. So basically, you cannot execute, for an example, JavaScript uh, from a different page than you're browsing, right? Because then you could inject code, right? And same thing, same thing here. If your internet service provider would allow people, random people, to address the port that was temporarily assigned to you, it would be super easy to, to hack you, right? Because you could, I mean, I could check that someone, for an example, made a request to Google, and I could send from my PC the contents of the web page, pretending it's Google, right? So most of the internet service provider have so-called restricted NAT. So you can only get a response from the guy whom you addressed in the first place. So how do we solve it? So the only way to solve it is to make a relay server. It's kind of like a proxy server which relays information between uh, two clients. So here we see that peer-to-peer -peer is not like, uh, it's kind of a peer-to-peer -peer because you have like a, a node that connects to uh, two clients. So one of the implementations of peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, which is kind of, it's kind of good, uh, it's called Epic Online Services and they give you free relay servers. So that, that sounds really cool because, okay, I don't need to manage any infrastructure. I just installed the, the Redpoint plugin and, and I have a peer-to-peer -peer game. And they have all those fencing stuff like cross-platform out. Uh, they have the party lobby system, right? Um, and you're basically only ma missing a matchmaking service to, to make a full game. But there are some cons of this because uh, there are a lot of bugs in, in the Redpoint's implementation. So we, we, we've uh, struggled with the events that were supposed to fire, not firing. There's no support for, it twi for 27, and um, there's no control over the relay location. So uh, you basically, you make a request to relay the peer-to-peer -peer game, and you don't know how it's going to be relayed. So, and, and EOS can be vulnerable, because, you know, all peer-to-peer -peer is. And uh, my colleague, Andrew, uh, highlighted this for me. So this is an application called Filter. You can just download it. A 10-year-old kid can just download it, double-click, and you can intercept traffic from EOS party system. And as you see, like, all the party data, this is a WebSocket connection. All the party data is kind of written in plain JavaScript. And uh, you might say, OK, but like every JSON, every HTTPS request is written in plain JSON. True, but the thing is that when you're making a peer-to-peer -peer game, someone is kind of authoritative over everything. So if you send data in, in using this channel, it's, uh, it's pretty easy to, to, you know, to get some, uh, some information like private user data. So EOS can be vulnerable if we, if we don't watch carefully what we are sending through it. There's another example of peer-to-peer -peer I really wanted to mention because uh, that's something I saw on Unreal Fest. I never implemented this, but I think it's important. Um, so what they did, they took a WebRTC relay and modified the net driver to, um, to make requests to it. They modified the protocol. Uh, and it's pretty interesting because uh, those are People Can Fly, and People Can Fly is all Epic games. And I showed you just before Epic Online Services, right? So either they know something that we don't know, or, 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 or I don't know. So this was, this was really worth m mentioning. And uh, did they really achieve a better solution than EOS? Uh, also in my career, I did self-developed relay. And there was an idea to make a, 
Well, sorry, let me catch a breath. <laughs> there was an idea to make a relay server uh, based on Unreal Engine. So in principle, there, in theory, uh, we could like deserialize data, validate it for anti-cheating, and then you had like a cheat-proof peer-to-peer uh, game. Um, but uh, it kind of ended up burning the money because uh, if you want to have a relay server that deserializes the data, you're going to at least use one CPU to host this relay server, right? And then you have to execute some logic. And, and then you're kind of building a dedicated server. So it, it doesn't really, didn't really make, uh, make much sense. Although I met a guy uh, today on the conference from Pragma. Pragma has some solution like this, but, um, but I still think it's not worth developing. I mean, you're making a very, very complex system here. So if you really want to make your own relay servers, I advise to go on GitHub, grab some proxy, and just modify it a little bit so the server can make the first request, and you can dig out the, the, the server's IP address to, to forward it further, right? Host migration. So uh, along peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, I've been developing host migration. Um, and the problem, you know, game is a product, right? And you expect it to work. And if you don't have host migration and you're have working, uh, playing a peer-to-peer -peer game, um, when the host disconnects, um, all the clients get an error, right? So the application malfunctions. The product is, uh, is not good, right? So uh, here's a basic way of doing a host migration. So you can have like a full peer-to-peer -peer game in Unreal Engine. It's pretty easy. You, you modify the engine header so the map won't reset. Then initialize game mode, game state in authoritative mode. You have to loop through all the actors and change the roles to authority. Start the net driver again and bang, you're the new host. And you were the client before, right? Then you can just reconnect all the clients and, uh, and that's it, right? So that's, uh, that's a base uh, host migration implementation that you could do. Of course, there's some caveats to it. And um, this is a case study when I tried to implement host migration in the very late stage of the, product, uh, of the, of the project. Um, so what happened is that basic Unreal stuff was, was working. Basic Unreal actors like the movement component, it's super simple. The state is shared along all the clients, so if you switch the authority, it works. But the more I dig into this, the more I had to modify. For an example, the gameplay ability component had to be, had to, had, uh, been modified to, uh, to, to change the authority. The AI were completely not initialized. Um, we had a lot of uh, logic and blueprints, a lot, a lot. So we would have to reinitialize all of them in the, in the server mode or try to develop a code that's kind of symmetric. Uh, and event batch based stuff didn't work at all. So you'd need to, if you have something that, that's uh, basing on events and you don't keep the state anywhere and just, you know, uh, the, the code reacts to, to a given event, events and that's more or less the state, so you, you have to cache that somewhere and share through all the clients. And this is like the only the beginning. So if we go back now and we think about the game as a, think, about, think of the game as a product, then we exchange one error to uh, multiple other small bugs. And then you would end up with months and months of fixing bugs. So summarizing, you're replacing one message with an endless list of bugs. I mean, it can be fixable, but you're trying to make a peer-to-peer -peer game to uh, lower your costs, and you kind of increase the maintenance cost by having a super complex system. Mm. So if you really want to do the host migration, you would really need to decide very early stage that you want to do it and kind of guide the developers that they, they need to make a more symmetric initialization of everything. Alternatives to peer-to-peer. -to -peer. Well, we all know the big tech uh, VMs like Gamelift, GCP, PlayFab. Uh, you've got Kubernetes clusters and container instances. So what are those container instances? We're going to find out in a bit. So when you host your game on uh, dedicated servers uh, in PlayFab or some other big tech, you basically pay all for the overhead, right? When no one is playing, and you require someone to, to uh, manage this, right? So you need a full-time DevOps. So it's kind of expensive. In, you could, uh, alternatively, you could, you could hire a company 
that uh, that's going to do that for you. And there are companies that uh, that basically what they do is the, they do the full game loop. So you basically develop the the uh, the game logic, and 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 what they do is they host it and they orchestrate it, etc. But it's also expensive. You share resources with other game instances. So if you have some CPU spikes, and you probably will have, it's going to affect other instances. The only good thing about this is that the crash dumps are super easy to retrieve. And dedicated server and container instances. So it's, um, you get uh, separated resources, so, so instances don't affect each other. And you pay only when people are playing. And I and I don't. Um, I'm not talking about here about GKE cluster with uh, with some nodes with an overhead. I'm talking here about spinning up a container and only paying when the container runs. And the only caveat to this is that crash dumps are difficult to obtain, maybe even impossible if uh, if you're running container instances on a, on a, on a cloud provider like I don't know Google or Amazon. So. There are solutions from big tech, like the Fargate, Azure Container Instances, the GCP Cloud Run, and they have all a very, very long start time for the container. So when, you're, uh, when you have like a game where you want four players to play against each other or, you know, or whatever, or play together, uh, they can't wait 30 seconds. They can't wait five minutes for the container to spin up. So. Uh, the good thing that you can control that, I mean, you could n build again a system with an overhead, right? You have the APIs, and then you would have to orchestrate. The only good thing about this is that you don't need to manage the regions so much. Sorry, you <laughs> need to manage the regions in this case. Uh, OK, so, uh, but still, someone will need to understand this and, um, uh, and, and be the DevOps, right? And. Uh, when I started working in the industry, I, I had like this idea that, wow, maybe someone could make a worldwide Kubernetes cluster, and we would all share the VMs, and we would all, we would all share the overhead. And uh, basically, those guys do it. And I found, them, I found them at Google while typing in container instances. And what they do is they have a, a, um, a caching mechanism. You know, they have like a few hundred locations around the world. And they have a caching mechanism for the container. So you upload the image of your game. It gets pulled to all the locations. And the start time of a container is as fast as uh, the start time uh, on your local PC. And that's a viable solution for gaming, because players can wait two seconds. Also, a really good thing is that uh, no DevOps is required to it. Uh, and they do geolocation, which is pretty cool. So basically, you send a, a list of IP addresses. Uh, and they find the location for you. So they spin up the server in the closest location to all four players, and it's super far cheaper than GameLift and PlayFab, and uh, because uh, because everyone is playing for for the overhead. Thank you for your attention. I'm sorry it was supposed to be longer, but I think I'm just talking very very fast. And I'm super stressed, so forgive me if you have too much free time. Um, if there are any questions in regards to the game, uh, you have to go through the community management of my game. So I can't answer any games about six days. But I love to answer your questions about, uh, about uh, infrastructure, peer-to-peer, -peer or dedicated servers. Thank you.